Well, hello, everyone. Welcome once again to another episode of the Mint Door podcast. I'm Dr. Laura Schwent. And I am Dr. Karen Tindall. And we would like to welcome to the podcast today our guest, Dr. Karen Kemp Prosterman. Thank you so much for being here with us hey. today. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to dive into everything um, that you have to talk about today. But first, let's just give a little bit of background. Um, and I'll introduce you a little but I'd, I'd love you to kind of take that from me and then elaborate on your background. So um, I love that you are affectionately known as Dr. KP. <laughs> Yes, I think I'm affectionately known as Dr. KP because people, uh, a lot of the residents were like, Dr. K, pra, K, and I'm like, just call me Dr. KP. Oh. And they were like, thank you. It was almost like with such gratitude. Oh. So it became something that was uh, born out of affection yeah. <laughs> of oh. the stumbling around of trying to say my name, especially um, when they needed me so urgently in the clinics. So it, um, I, for, for years, it was like, Dr. Camp, and then one day my husband visited me to the clinic and he was like, why is everyone just calling you Camp? I'm like, okay. So we were going to say Dr. Camp Rostrum from now on. Um, and so we started going with that. So it was like Dr. KP works. Oh. And um, it just caught on. The residents loved it. The parents definitely loved it. It was just easier for everybody all around. Mm -hmm. um, for the little patients, Dr. Karen. I don't, I don't know if you use that also with them, but that's always easier mm -hmm. um, to use with them. But we had a few Karens also in the clinic, so it became a little confusing. So Dr. KP was always my, my go-to because it was always my own. Oh, well, it's a very affectionate, loving name. And <laughs> I should mention that you are a practicing pedodontist with over 15 years of experience doing that. That is so, correct. That's wonderful. And you graduated from your PEDS residency in 2005. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, and since then, you've been kind of involved in faculty work. So I hear you, you know, you're working with residents and um, also engaged in um, educational pursuits as well. And so maybe give us a little bit of, of your background is how, how you got to where you are now, just your, a little bit of your history. So after I finished residency, I actually stayed at my hospital for a number of years. I started as an associate um, faculty member there and eventually became the program director at Bronx Lebanon Hospital. Um, it was very good to kind of fill that arc um, going from resident to program director because it was a very young program when I started there. And it, it gave me a chance to be able to give some input on the things that as a resident, I didn't have much say. And as the program director was like, oh, this is the thing that I always wanted to fix. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and so was able to actually give from a resident perspective, no residents need more time to do research and they need more time for this. And I think it helped me to build quite a rapport with the residents that way, because I really did know how they felt. I really didn't know what they need and, really worked on trying to build a wonderful program where I, I strive to make space for them to be able to fill their educational requirement, but also get that clinical experience that hospital programs are pretty well known for. So they kind of got the best of both worlds and was pretty proud of that. Um, after that, I loved obviously working with residents, but I wanted to get my hands back into seeing patient care so desperately. Um, and so I did that. I did that in Brooklyn for a little bit. And then I came to Connecticut. Um, my husband um, transferred for his work here and I'm so, do, so did I. And um, did that for a number of years working um, in DSO at, at Benevis and really helping to move those offices along and trying to get general dentists comfortable seeing pediatric patients mm -hmm. and trying to really figure out who was really good at it, who really it was a challenge for them. And then obviously just doing the most to make sure that the patients were getting the care that they needed. Mm -hmm. um, it gave me an opportunity to be one of the providers who didn't feel like they were above DSOs because that was kind of a trying period where a lot of people felt, oh, wow, they're just mills, right? And I was always the person of, if we all feel that way as specialists, these DSOs will never get to a point where we think they should be. 
Mm-hmm. And so if you feel that way, you should actually work with them. You mm-hmm. should make them better because we all want the same thing, quality care for patients. Mm-hmm. And so I was happy to, to join. Um, they were happy to have me there. And I really felt good about hiring and recruiting doctors who I still keep in touch with today. Mm-hmm. Um, so very proud of that. Um, did that for a number of years, but it was it was tough running five offices. And my son at the time was very young and I realized I was missing out for a little bit of, you know, school drop-offs and all kinds of activities. And I had an aging mom who was living with me as well. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make a choice of, this is taking up a lot of time. These other things are really important to me. And so I had to step back and making that decision is something that every working mom and, you know, wife and mother really has to kind of balance for a little bit. And so I took a step back and was gonna take a year off and then the faculty position opened up at UConn. And during my time of, I'm gonna stay on for a year. Yes, I'm going to, no, not quite, but I'm going to do this. And I just couldn't resist. So when that opportunity presented itself, I was like, well, it's gonna be easier. And it was. And so I, I took that opportunity and I'm happy that I did. Um, And it was easier in some ways and not in others, but I'm glad that I did. And my husband saw that it still gave me the best opportunity to still work and be there for for our son in terms of all the school activities. So it did actually work out. Um, Not quite the way I expected, but it's somewhat very close. So that's kind of been my whole transition. Mm -hmm. You're also the founder of uh, PGP Dental Consulting, called Consultancy, sorry. And it's a coaching service that is focused on dental providers pursuing dental specialties. Yes. And so tell me how, what inspired that? How did that develop? And tell me a little bit about that. So... I'm one of those individuals, I think, um, after dental school, I've always been very passionate, not about living somebody else's dream, but I've realized how much energy I was putting into someone else's dream, (laughs) basically, working for a hospital program, working for the university, very passionate about making everything a success. And then during the pandemic, I think was when I actually, we all stopped, right? We all were forced to stop and think about what actually what happened if we weren't able to resume our normal lives in the way that we thought. And so it gave me a lot of pause to think about what else would I do if I couldn't do patient care the way that I wanted to do it? What else in dentistry am I good at that I enjoy? And I knew that I enjoyed helping people to realize their dreams as well, mentoring and coaching. So I thought about that and I actually revisited a conversation I had with one of the last individuals that I helped with their application. Even after I left being the program director, I was still helping people, friends that I knew who were applying for PETO. And the last individual I helped with that, she had a lot of difficulties with her application. She was very doubtful that she would get in. Um, but we worked through it. It was tough. She did the work that she needed to do and she got in. And she's about to graduate actually this summer. Um, And I remembered her telling me when she got in at UT, she's like, I never would have done this. I never thought that they would take me after everything that happened, but you actually, you know, said some hurtful things at the time, but it was true. Um, But you stuck with me as we did it together. And she thanked me profusely. Mm -hmm. And she's like, you really should help a lot more people. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that. And I started to write my things down of, you know, what am I good at? What do I really enjoy doing? This is what I love doing. And I started to put it together. What would this look like? Who do I want to help? And I wanted to focus on helping individuals who were already out of dental school. Because when I thought about it, individuals in dental school have all of that at their disposal, right? They have a DIA, they have uh, faculty members like myself, they have a lot of resources that they can rely on. But once you graduate, all of that kind of narrows down a little bit and you don't have those resources and you actually don't realize how much you lose until you're gone. And so that's the person who I wanted to help. And I started to think about past residents and who 
appreciated that opportunity the most. And they were older individuals who didn't realize until later what they wanted to do. And now that they had the opportunity, they were so grateful when mm -hmm. someone took, not took a chance on them, but just realized their potential and actually gave them an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I decided that this is what I wanted to focus on. I wanted to help those individuals removed from dental school who need a little extra coaching on trying to get their application together and help guide them to being their actual successful self. Mm, that's so cool. <laughs> it's, it's hard work. I mean, it takes a lot to try to really get people sometimes to focus back on the things that listen, we have to be honest about how this application look and this is what it looks like. Um, and trying to get people to sometimes really focus on that can be challenging. But mm -hmm. once we can get past a few things, I think, you know, they're willing to, they, they, they know the desire that they have. And once they face the realities of what's there and are prepared to do the work for it, you know, we buckle down and we get it done on those applications. So I feel good about it. It's nice that you can be that guide to yeah. show somebody that journey a journey that you know very well and have shared many times before that like you're a sherpa for them really mm -hmm. aren't you to you know i because i remembered my opportunity when i first graduated from dental school and i applied for pedo and i didn't get in i had some applications but i did a gp um and that general practice residency program I'm telling you, that was the best thing for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it at the time, but that's when I actually learned my hand skills and I learned to love dentistry. Mm -hmm. And it actually made me a better pediatric dentist because I wasn't doing things by default. Mm -hmm. And so when people looked at me like, oh, you're a pediatric dentist, but you're gonna, you're gonna take up, yeah, you, you wanna go for that third month? I know how to do this stuff. I'm not, this is not just a pretty face, people. <laughs> I know how to go in there and take that tooth out. Yes, I do. Let's do this <laughs> now. We can do this. And so you, you learn these skills. And so trying to encourage people to see the disappointment sometimes that you experience, it, it might be taking you down a different path that may be better for you later on. Mm -hmm. So don't look at it as that. It's hard in the moment, but you just never know. Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to help them with. That makes me think of something that you said, Laura, um, a while ago, that if you like didn't get something, it just presents different opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So all of that from both of you is really great advice. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think that's great advice because um, I, I, I think that sometimes we, we've, especially as high achievers, as, as women, women dentists and women doctors, we get focused on a path and we know all the steps. We know what to, we have people helping us with all the steps. And, and when we get derailed from that path a little bit in our minds, derailed, sometimes we just don't even know what to do. We've never even thought that through. And I love the fact that you are guiding um, your clients with how to navigate those, those derailments in a positive way. And how not to feel embarrassed about it. I think mm -hmm. one of the things for anyone, but especially like you're saying for high achievers, for doctors, we, we look at what we call failures, right? So someone who has an application where when you're in dental school, you know, yes, anatomy is hard and maybe you didn't get an A or a B, or maybe it took you a while to buckle down through sophomore year or maybe you didn't have a mentor and you really struggled through dental school. And then later on, as you practice, it all clicked for you. You know, we're not all the same. And so a lot of people carry that kind of embarrassment with them. You know, it's amazing with that transcript and how that labels you and, and it kind of determines, oh my God, I can't, cause you know, they're gonna look at the transcript and oh, that's all they're gonna see. You're more than what that paper says. Mm -hmm. And the things that you've done in your private practice and all, how you've gone on to achieve all these other things, let that speak volumes for you, you know? So you, a lot of people just need that self-esteem boost. They mm -hmm. forget all of the, these wonderful achievements they've gone on to do. Mm -hmm. Running a practice, being an associate in someone's practice, doing all these wonderful things in the community let that speak for you. And so they have to have someone sometimes just find their voice, mm -hmm. create that voice for them and let them create that narrative to say, hey, 
you know, that was in the past. This is the person I am today. And this is why I'm going to be a great asset for your program now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it takes a little bit to, to show someone that, but once you do, and you see that light go off in their head, it's an amazing thing. Oh, it sounds like this is what you were meant to do. Yeah. You know, I don't know if so, there are some days when I'm working with the client, I'll be honest, I'm like, I'm exhausted, but, but the joy of, you know, at the end of it, when they get that phone call or the match day and it worked out, or even if they're going through post-match and if it didn't work out, it's like, look, we can still manage this. You're still a worthwhile person, no matter what happens here. Mm -hmm. And talking about the numbers, this is like anything else. If you don't get in, it isn't a reflection of who and what you are. It's just mm -hmm. maybe not this year, you know, pandemic has wreaked havoc with application systems. Dentistry is no different. Mm -hmm. um, so just to try to take it in stride and try to look at the upside of it. Like you said earlier, look at where this path is leading you no matter mm -hmm. what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um, we, we have a little warm up here, but before we get in that one quick question, okay. if there were uh, a dentist who is out in practice and has an inkling that they, they want to go back and specialize, what would you tell them? What would be the first thing to do? What would be one, one little, one little step to take to, to start that process? I would say the first step is to talk to someone in the field that you think you want to go into. Mm -hmm. really find someone and find someone who's like not the sweet doctor in that field find someone who's tough find someone who's tough and you might even be scared of that's the person you go and you sit and you talk to nope. that's the person who's going to tell you the real deal of this is what compensation looks like this is what dealing with these parents or dealing with these patients look like this is the real deal of what this field looks like on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. And if you come and follow me and walk around for a week and you see everything that I deal with, then you tell me if you still want to do this, because mm -hmm. you have to really know what you're getting yourself into. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing, like pedo is my world. So I use it as an example. I said to people, if I read one more essay of the little Maria in Guadalamala who changed my life and no one cares, <laughs> and that seems harsh, but that's the reality. No one cares. I want to know if you care about the kid down the block, because that's the one you're going to see every day, not the one who was on the mission trip that you may never see again. Mm -hmm. I want to know what you want to do in your community, how we're going to be better off with you in our field. Mm -hmm. Give me that. You don't have to go for all of that. Just tell me what you're going to do day to day. Mm -hmm. And do you really know what you're getting yourself into? And are you prepared for it? Because it's not as glamorous, right? We're not all rock stars. You want the vomit, you want the screaming. This is what we go through. You know, <laughs> if you can still put a smile on your face at the end of that day. I am your captain. I'm ready to help you realize your dream. <laughs> so that, that's the kind of person I think you go find that person in that field is going to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. And then if you decide I can deal with that, mm -hmm. then that's for you. Oh, that's excellent advice. Thank you. You're welcome. Wow. I think that's really good advice for, for a lot of different things. Like I'm, I'm it's thinking, unvarnished. <laughs> yeah, thinking of my teenagers right now. <laughs> be realistic mm -hmm. and be real. So on the topic of being real, we have almost like a rapid fire round of questions. Okay. It's kind of like a this or that game. We're going to admit Laura and I are going to get to popcorn between us and we're just going to ask you to make a decision here and here and now about the questions that we are going to gently fire at your way. I'm ready. <laughs> fire at you. Okay. So I'm going to start off and then Laura will take it um, every other one. So do you dry your hair or air dry your hair? Air dry. Okay. Heels or tennies? Oh, both. <laughs> I know that seems crazy, but... I like them both. No, that's okay. That's okay. That's cool. yeah. uh, yoga pants or jeans? Yoga pants. Mm -hmm. uh, early bird or night owl? Early bird. <laughs> Mountains or ocean? Ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, breakfast or no breakfast? Breakfast. Okay. Eat out or eat in? Eat in. Mm -hmm. 
Movies or Netflix? Netflix. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a book or a Kindle? Book. Mm-hmm. Cat or dog? Dog. Oh. But I love cats. Dog. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a burger or a salad? Burger. Bad. And then Saturday or Sunday? Saturday. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sunday's too close to Monday. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <laughs> oh. well, now we have the real. <laughs> was just, uh, that was you funny. Being, you were real before, but now we know all those little bits about you as well. So. <laughs> We know if we take you out for lunch that you're going to have the burger. Yes, yes. What are you going to ask to take it home? Is it going to be salads and I'm the only burger girl? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that that's sounds awesome. good. So, I mean, one thing that is really obvious when we talk to you is that you're always happy and smiley. Um, and we know that you like traveling and we know that you like laugh a lot as well. And there's a lot of joy in your life. So, Tell us a little bit about how the traveling and the laughter piece like shapes your day-to-day life. I think for me, um, if I'm not planning a trip, I've just come back from one. <laughs> I think I, it's one of the reasons why the pandemic for me um, was very hard because I am so used to, to being on the go and planning a trip to, is almost as good as being on it, quite mm-hmm. frankly. I love details. I love, you know, thinking about the hotel and finding the spot and all the stuff and the dodgy parts of town to avoid. I love that stuff, the itinerary. And it's not like I'm rigid, like we're going on a tour and it starts at this time. I'm not that. I'm very laid back, like, hey, do your thing. But I want to find all the options of what what I want to do. Um, So I finally went on a trip uh, for the first time uh, last year, uh, since the pandemic. And I went, uh, it was supposed to be a girl's trip and it was supposed to be four of us. And we had originally planned to go to Cape Town before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the pandemic hit and of course that fell apart. And then we were gonna try to salvage it. Of course, we paid for it and everything. Um, and then Cape Town obviously was not the location. So we decided to move it. And so it was like, okay, let's go to Dubai. Mm -hmm. Long story short, four people went down to three people, went down to just me and my bestie. And the day of the trip, she's flying from the Bahamas. I'm coming into JFK. I'm at the airport and she calls me. She's like, they won't accept my my COVID test at Miami and because it'll be out of date by the time I land in Dubai. I ended up in Dubai by myself. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I had the most amazing time. Wow. I did not care. Like she was sad. But it was like, even with everybody windled, it all went to, to, you know, it just fell apart. I ended up there by myself. I had an amazing time. I made new friends. I went to the World Expo. I'm like, I'm here. I'm going to have a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. Went to the desert, rode a camel, did all the things I wanted to do. My husband was like, are you okay? Are you sure you should still go? I'm like, sure, I'm still going. I'm going, I'm enjoying all of this. (laughs) (laughs) and I just had fun um so I like to just try new things I think life is too short to be afraid or not take a risk um which oddly enough as an entrepreneur if that's the thing I'm willing to do these things for other people and to work so hard but I was so scared to actually become my own entrepreneur, just try this hand at this business because I was like, I haven't thought this through enough. I haven't done all of this enough. Mm -hmm. And my passion through working with children, this is going somewhere, follow me, (laughs) is all about, you know, how to make the lives of families that I've seen, especially the special needs families that I work with on a daily basis. I've seen them, especially through COVID era, really struggle. 
And so I thought healthcare really needs a reboot. It needs to be helped. And we need to start working in silos and education and healthcare and medicine and dentistry really need to coincide a lot better cohesively. And so I decided like we need to make things easier for parents, but nothing's created. So I decided I wanna create my own digital healthcare platform. And that's how Pete's Town is being born. Um, and I'm throwing my hand in the ring of trying to create a simple, not so simple, I found, <laughs> but a healthcare uh, uh, app for parents, which ties in with their medical dental home, but it also incorporates both nutrition and education so that we can all try to work together to help parents understand all of these social determinants and how they work together for their own child's success. And it's shifting how healthcare is just not about your diagnosis, the treatment plan, but how it relates to these other factors of education, nutrition, and how it all marries together. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I've, while I'm creating my entrepreneurship with working with uh, dentists, trying to help them achieve their dreams, I'm also trying to stick to the passion of children and the things that I like. And I'm doing this at the same time. It's driving me crazy a little, but I can't help it. Is is an opportunity presented with this, and I'm like, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to create this app, and so I'm doing both of these things together. And and some days I love it. Some days I cry myself to sleep, but I'm having a good time <laughs> most of the time. I'm having a good time learning as much as I can. <laughs> well, I suppose the, the the entrepreneurial process you could kind of. Um, you could kind of mirror with your experience on your trip to Dubai and just how there were ups and downs, right? And, yeah. you know, at first it was four people and then it was two and then it was just you, but then you ended up having a blast. And I'm sure while you were there, there was ups and downs. Yeah, it was, it was really trying to figure out to rely on myself, but to, like we said at the beginning, to take this opportunity for what it is, mm -hmm. right? Enjoy it, have as much fun with it. Mm -hmm. I might fail at some things, but at least I have an opportunity to try it. Mm -hmm. And I won't know until I try. Yeah. And it's just, mm -hmm. you wanna just go out in this world and know that I did it, whatever it is, I gave it my best mm -hmm. and I gave it a shot and I tried. You know, try to climb that mountain. I'm not just going to sit here as a happy camper through life, just watching it sail on by. Right. I am going to climb the mountain. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's, that's how I approach every day. Mm -hmm. And I, I learn as I go. I'm willing to learn. I don't take myself too seriously. I think that's why I love pedo because it's like, I look at the kids, they look at me like, you don't take yourself seriously, neither do you. So let's just have, let's do what we do, you know? And we just have ourselves a good time because mm -hmm. we're all here to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and so having that kind of mindset where there's something I can learn from another person, mm -hmm. it takes the stress off. You don't always have to be right. You don't always have to win. You know, you don't always have to win at someone else's cost. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it gives you take a little bit of stress off and you know that, hey, tomorrow's another day. Mm -hmm. If I didn't get it right today, I'll get it right tomorrow. <laughs> You know, what, what, um, what strikes me about you is you have a very high um, growth mindset, which I, I feel like sometimes in, in our educational process, we, we stray away from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, I'm curious with your extensive background and the position you're in now, what do you think is the current state of dentistry and dental education and, and how, what are your hopes for the future of it? So to be honest with you, I think, I feel like dentistry is on a precipice of going one of two ways. Um, and for me, I think there are a few people who want to shake it up a little bit, who want to actually see substantive change occur and there are the majority of other people who want to either return to or normalcy or just coast and keep going on a certain path. And I think both of these avenues 
obviously you can't travel on the same road and we have to decide which way we want to go. I say that because I read, um, and I don't know if both of you have seen it, but there was a Health Policy Institute uh, webinar that came out in March and it showed kind of a reflection of the dental workforce. And one of the slides that was in the webinar was reflecting kind of like the mindset of how dentists want to work right now, right? And so DSOs are kind of very high on the list. People are shying away or going away from wanting to be a solo practitioner. Um, they're going into more group practices, working for DSOs has taken on a more positive light in dentistry, which is definitely a shift. Um, but it also showed a little bit kind of the racial breakdown and, um, and going across the field of where we have increased um, and where we have plateaued. And as an African-American dentist, I couldn't help but look to see that African-American black dentist workforce, 3% for 20 years from 2001 to 2022, um, 2021, stayed at between 3.3 to 3.9%. Wow. And it was stunning to me. Mm -hmm. What was more stunning was that it wasn't even mentioned in the webinar. Mm. They talked about the increases within the Asian um, uh, population of dental workforce, as well as uh, Latina X, um, Hispanic population, which are good things. Those increased um, doubled in some instances, and they showed the reflection with the general population, US population. So those are good things. But I thought to myself, in 20 years, we haven't even cracked a percent. And this is despite the pipeline and different educational efforts that have, been, that have been implemented over the years. And so that showed me that something has to change. Efforts have been put into place, implemented, but nothing's really changing. And why is that? So we have to look at something a little bit more innovative and a, a little bit differently. And to go to your point about growth mindset, mm -hmm. I think dentistry has a tendency to lag behind in terms of our mindset. Mm -hmm. And women have definitely come a long way as part of that growth part, they showed it in the webinar, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. But the mindset in dentistry is a little bit too insular, I think still, it lags behind. We still use the same syringe. <laughs> and I think that's, that's indicative of how a lot of people feel about dentistry. If it ain't broke, you don't need to fix it. Mm -hmm. And that syringe works and as archaic as it looks, we're gonna stick with that. <laughs> but the question is not if it doesn't work. The question is, can we do it better? Mm. And I think that's the thing. You don't have to denigrate something to say that you want to look for improvement. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. there's anything wrong and you're, you're castigating what came before. You're just asking the question of, can we do it better? And I think if we try to phrase it so that people don't automatically become defensive of what once was in historical precedence, then maybe we can start to work together better for everybody mm -hmm. and people won't have such a tendency to want to go to their corners automatically and proclaim nothing's wrong here <laughs> you know like that's the automatic thing that people want to do nothing's wrong nothing's wrong mm -hmm. there's a lot wrong but you know we don't we can get to that point in a minute but how about we just grow and in dental education, I think for me, working both in hospital dentistry and then coming to a university program, it was surprising to me to see how insular academia at a university can be. And I was kind of more stunned to find that versus at a hospital dentistry. Um, hospital dentistry was a lot more integrated. They worked together. There was a lot more collaboration with the hospital and the different departments and disciplines. And it was, it's surprising that even within the dental school, it's so separated with the different departments. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot more collaboration needed. I think people really need to foster a better sense of not feeling like they have to mark their territory so much. Mm -hmm and mm -hmm. just want to help the patients. And I said this to someone the other day, um, a friend of mine, um, and he was shocked. I said, you know, you know who seems to get the shortest end of the stick in healthcare? And he said, who? 
the patients. Mm -hmm. I said, in, in healthcare education, we are so busy trying to cover ourselves and do things. I think we almost forget to care about the patients. Mm -hmm. We don't talk to the patients, we talk at them. Mm -hmm. We tell them what's good for them, mm -hmm. but we don't really talk to them like they're stakeholders in their own health. Mm -hmm. And it's a part of health equity, right? Like we don't have research that really engages with the patients enough to find out in the community, why aren't you showing up to your appointments? You know, what's hard for you? What would make it easier? We just automatically say, well, you're on Medicaid, so you don't have enough skin in the game. So of course you don't show up on time because you don't pay for it. But it's a little bit more complicated than that, you mm -hmm. know? And so if we talk to them, if we talk to the community reps and we get more involved, then maybe we'll see these other social determinants that really impact a parent wanting to come, but our rules say that if the parent's not there, then you can't serve the patient. It's a lot of things that just domino on top of itself. And they have really significant impact. But the growth mindset, I would love to see that expand. I think from dental education standpoint, a very simple avenue that I would love to see the first implementation of it would be just psychological safety for dental faculty. And it's something that dentistry has done very well in terms of implementing it for students, which is a good thing. But I think the middle management, the dental faculty doesn't have that kind of layer and pr protection. Mm -hmm. And these are the people where there isn't an intentional effort made by dental schools or even in healthcare in general, I think significant enough where we create teams that work together. We just naturally feel like if you're a specialist, you're an oral surgeon, you're a pediatric dentist, I'm gonna get all of you together and you're gonna work together. We have no idea if these people have any training in education. We just hire you because you're a specialist and we assume automatically, therefore, you should be able to teach. That doesn't mean that. Mm -hmm. And so you have to actually develop these individuals to teach, but most schools don't. So there's so much in professional development that's left off the table mm -hmm. and it's just left to the individual to train themselves. You can't do that. Not if you want a successful team. Right. So I think there's a lot organized dentistry and governing bodies can do to lay a kind of a groundwork for mm -hmm. dental schools to actually follow. And they can put it in the code of standards, which will be easy for then dental schools to follow a template that they know that they're gonna have oversight on in their accreditation. So hopefully we'll see. That's amazing. Yeah, this growth mindset isn't always appreciated. Oh. <laughs> I can tell you in faculty meetings, they're like, just drink the Kool-Aid. We don't wanna hear, no, no, just say yes. It just, the meeting has to end, Dr. Kemp. It has to end. Mm. <laughs> I think that's a beautiful ma mantra to uh, can, how can we do it better? How can we do it better? Yeah, yeah. And it is for my own growth, it's taken me a while to try to figure out how to influence people. Mm -hmm. um, I was so caught up for a long time in trying to constantly figure to get my point across, right? Why can't you see things as clearly? This doesn't make any sense. And it's a lot of times everyone gets caught in that, that rut. Mm -hmm. And I stopped trying to keep beating my head against a wall. And so I'm trying to take a step back and understand people's personalities. Mm -hmm. What are their motivational drivers? Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to figure out if I understand your motivation and what ticks, and it's different for different people, but then I can try to influence you. Mm -hmm. And then I can try to figure out how to make an effective team who is going to be a good effective team player and who's not and who to invest my time with and who not to. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the course that I'm trying to travel right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, I think it's less stress when you try to do it that way versus the other, you know, where to put your energy, but it's, it's a pity. The growth mindset, I, I, and I asked someone the other day, what's the vision of our department? Can you tell me? And the person just stared at me. Mm. But it's like, these are the things 
healthcare shouldn't be so different from any business or any other organization. If we want success, it's the same fundamentals of what makes a successful team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We just happen to treat patients. That's all. Right. Right. Very wise. Very yes. wise. <laughs> ah, awesome. All right. Um, you know, you, you highlighted a little bit about Pedestown, but I'd love you to maybe walk us through your vision of mm -hmm. when it's up and running. What does it do? Awesome. I've been asked this question several times <laughs> lately by my software engineer, by a few people on the investment. So yes. So ideally, Pete's Town would look like <clears throat> you have an app that is accessible, both web-based, mobile-based. Mm -hmm. And what you would have is um, two different versions of it. So a parent would go into their regular medical or dental home and the, um, let's say we're dentists. So you go into your dental office and let's say it's a father who's taking their child in, don't have a clue about the, you know, the pediatrician's name or anything like that. And it's the first time they're taking the child in for a visit. So if, for example, the child, the mother had signed up with Pete's town and the doctor was saying, oh, you know, I'm this patient is in here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to treat you patient's medical history and everything. But I'm, I see that he has some cavities and I know that he has asthma. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, this is what you need to do. We're going to set you up with some appointments. I'm going to go over your medical history and I'm going to create a little plan. So before you come back for your next visit, I want you to make sure you're paying attention to your fluoride, make sure that you're definitely using that because it's on asthma medication that has an impact. Work on our carries uh, regimen, focus on all of that. I'm gonna put it in the Pete's Town app. Dad has no clue. So he's like, just read the, it's gonna give you an alert. Pete's Town, it's an app. Your wife signed up for it already. She has it, you, you have a login. So when you log in, you're gonna see that I have a plan here. It's gonna tell you what to do before your next visit. And if you want, you can even be set up with a nutrition. A nutritionist will reach out to talk to you about the foods that you can use. And if he's struggling with sleeping at home, you might have a little testing for ADHD. I see that in here from your child's pediatrician. Then obviously, then you can talk to an educational specialist too that can help you with that. So when dad logs in, because he'll have a separate login for Pete's Town, he will be able to like, the, uh, the doctor, the dentist was telling him, he'll be able to actually see the notes from any other visits in terms of messages of different milestones that we wanted to work on. So the dental provider will be able to put in, uh, this is the healthcare messages that I have for you. So if I wanted you to work on in between visits, reducing soda intake, reducing our, our carries and, and snacks during meal time. Anything that I wanted you to work on healthcare objectives and goals, it was listed in here. It's HIPAA um, compliant. And so therefore it will be able to be protected. It will be able to be synced up to an actual EHR, but both medical and dental. And so father will be able to track and he'll be able to see, oh, that's the pediatrician's name. This is the dentist's name. He can see all of his healthcare homes in there. And he can also see if there was a nutritionist already on board who was telling the mom about, this is the kind of foods you wanna eat. This is the kind of things you wanna avoid. If it's ADHD, an educational specialist was advised, they can go over different things to talk about for school. So it will give them an opportunity to understand the child's diagnosis, both medical and dental. It'll give them some support services in terms of education and nutrition. And it'll just be able to help them focus on in-between visits different things that actually can work on at home just to make sure they get ahead of what's going to be more successful for this child. Mm -hmm. Tying it up with all the different things that gives them success, basically both educational and nutrition. So as you get more complex in terms of uh, 
diagnosis, like for kids who have really complex medical diagnosis, this becomes a lot more helpful to the parents because it helps them understand after that medical visit is over, all of these different things and how they tie into the different factors with the nutritionist, with an educational specialist. So that's kind of like how it would work. If you're, um, the goal for me, what I want to do is not to have parents have to pay for this. And so it's a service that I'm trying to do through social entrepreneurship Mm -hmm. and trying to find a fiscal sponsor Mm -hmm. and absolutely trying to have it where we can work out where healthcare systems or basically the providers are charged a subscription fee to, to kind of pay for this, but have these parents and these families not be able to have to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Because these are at-risk families who really need kind of like a coaching help. I mean, there's coaching services for everybody, for everything, mm-hmm. but families who struggle the most have nobody really helping guide them mm-hmm. and they need it the most. So that's what I want Pete's Town kind of to, mm-hmm. to be able to supplement. Mm-hmm. I, I love the um, kind of on-demand aspect of it as well in the sense that um you know they can access that information when their brain is ready to digest it yes <laughs> it is i mean have you all been there in the doctor's office like you sit and you talk and we can talk for like that hour visit but it's a lot i mean i've even been there in the doctor's office with my son it's like oh my god i forgot to ask that question right like there's so many things that come to you later on mm-hmm. and when you're in the convenience of your own home to be able to just go back to the app, to look at the stuff, oh, this is what he wants me to focus on. And they get to set the frequency of, do you want messages sent to you? Do you want alerts to come to you and tie in with, oh, sugar, did you want this article? Like to have the service send you things, but you get Mm -hmm. to dictate for the frequency and different alerts. And it ties into your provider. So as you finish these goals, your provider will be able to see that, okay, we were decreased the soda intake and they did the exercise regimen and the provider can see that you successfully did this. So that when you do go back to that doctor's visit three weeks from now, whatever, at least your doctor can have that already. And so now that 30 minute appointment could be a little bit more meaningful. Mm-hmm. You can get more done because then they can already tr- check that off. And then they can say, well, you did this and this, how did that go? And we can move on to something else. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a little bit, because those appointment times go by so quickly. Mm -hmm. And so it gives an opportunity for parents to at least get a little bit more out of the actual Mm -hmm. hands-on visit in the office. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal of it. So we'll see if it actually actually works out. Well, I I think it sounds absolutely amazing. And um, I think with your growth mindset and, positive attitude and uh, laurels, it'll get done for sure. (laughs) I certainly hope so. I really hope that it it works out for families the way I think, or that I learned something new from working with a a sample group of patients, Mm -hmm. what will even make it work more for them. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm willing to even like tweak to find a, a, a patient pool that finds like, hey, this will be even more effective for me yeah. and make it make it work for them. Well, we wish you all the best with that. Like yeah. we're excited to see where this rocket ship takes you. And <laughs> you're go. Like, it's, Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it sounds exciting. Yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure visiting with you. We should um, probably wrap things up today for our listeners. We try and keep these concise so that, you know, busy, busy women doctors are. (laughs) Um, But uh, if, if someone were interested in um, maybe a consultation or working with you, if they had an inkling of um, using you as a coach for um, going into a specialty, um, where can they find you? How how do we how do we locate you? So they can find me through pgpdentalconsultancy.com. Okay. And I also have uh, Instagram. So we can you can find Dr. Camp Rosterin on LinkedIn, first of all. Okay. And there's an actual it's page, and forgive my computer. There's a page. <laughs> linked for uh, PGP Dental Consultancy through LinkedIn as well. Um, But there's also an Instagram uh, page as well, affiliated with it. On the Instagram page as well, there's a bio site that makes it a little bit easier when you click the link that you can have access to all of these things pretty easily. Okay. But 
Sometimes the LinkedIn is very easy, accessible. Send me a message, happy to, you know, to definitely follow up with anybody. And even if someone isn't sure about it, one of the good things I always like to do with new clients or anyone thinking about it is to have like a 30 minute consultation mm -hmm. to just make sure that this works, answer any questions that you have and make sure that I'm a good coach for you and that you're a good client for me because it only works if we both get along. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, we will make sure and put your links to LinkedIn, Instagram, and your website all in the show notes. So if anybody um, is interested in reaching out to Dr. KP, as she's mm -hmm. affectionately known as, um, uh, just check out those links. And thank you so much for all that you do and for um, just always wanting to do it better. I think that uh, you've you've inspired me. I'm gonna remember. I'm gonna remember that phrase um, every time I uh, I tackle a challenge. Can we do it better? It's so cool. It, it's, I, no, you <laughs> keep going. I was gonna say something at the end. No, 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 no. I, it's just it's the easiest thing. It's just not to take yourself too seriously in life. Yes. I feel like that's just the easiest thing to do. Yes. And I was just going to say, from one Dr. Karen to another Dr. Karen. Like you are an, another example of why Karens are good. And there is too much Karen hate that goes on in the media today. And like, no, like it does start to bother me every now and then when people have a go at Karens or call somebody a Karen. And like the more good Karens that we find, the more we need to highlight them. So support group. <laughs> good Karens. I have yes. never met a not good Karen. So I have no idea where I love Karens. <laughs> so that's a good I'm thing. with you. I'm with you. <laughs> good Karens right here. Try that's to right. Them. That's right. Excellent. Well, thank you for spending some time with us. And we will be sure to touch base with you as um Peds Town develops. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. It was a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. Take care.